I'm so happy you're here today because we're going to look at a very common practice that doesn't have an evidence base to support it. We're going to take a closer look at the evidence and we're going to try to get back on track with what the research says is best practice and get away from the it's based on someone said so, which is where we are when it comes to the principles of non-speech motor learning. Let me give you a little bit background. In 2008, Edwin Moss and colleagues wrote an article called The Principles of Motor Learning and Treatment of Motor Speech Disorders. And in this theoretical article, Edwin Moss and his colleagues were saying, maybe we should look at the principles of non-speech motor learning, such as how to swing a golf club and how that applies in treating speech motor disorders. So it was just a theoretical what if sort of paper. Unfortunately, it's very misleading because when you look at the article, it's subtitled tutorial. So if you read tutorial in AJSLP, you're going to assume, well, this is how you do something. This is for clinical practice. It's called tutorial. This is a how-to. However, as stated every paragraph in the article practically, it's not a tutorial, and this is not to be extrapolated for clinical practice. This is simply theory, and, and the, it's stated time and time again throughout the article that there's absolutely no research to support motor learning principles for non-speech behavior, such as a neurotypical adult swinging a golf swing, is not to be applied to the treatment of speech motor disorders. It's just an idea paper which says, maybe this is something we should research to see if it is effective or not. Unfortunately, many people took this article and ran with it. And they took this article as hints, because this article is written as a tutorial, that this is evidence that you should take the principles from the adult that's swinging a golf club and apply them to the preschool with childhood apraxia of speech, or apply them to the preschool that has difficulty with the R's, or apply them to the preschool with difficulty with phonological processes. These are, after all, principles of motor learning from this tutorial. And this article is cited as the evidence base for doing so, even though the article says there's no evidence for doing so. That's what the article concludes time and time again. So since this article was written, Edwin Moss and colleagues did a number of studies that showed that these principles of motor learning with children, sometimes they work, half the time they work, and half the time they don't work. So that is something known as chance. Here is a coin, a penny. You could toss the coin and you would have chance. That is not evidence-based practice. That is not enough evidence to inform clinical practice. Two children, one it works for, one it doesn't. Four children, one it works for, three it doesn't. Four children, two it works for, two it doesn't. That's called chance. That is not an evidence base. So we're gonna move forward because there's so many seminars and workshops out there that propose that you should use the principles of motor learning when you're treating speech motor disorders. And that simply is not an evidence-based practice. So let's talk about why. I wanna look at three areas of feedback that are recommended in the principles of motor learning research in which you're researching the man that's neurotypical, middle-aged, swinging a golf club and how he's going to get better at golf and you're applying it to preschoolers. So I hope you can see already the problem with that when it comes with feedback. Someone that's middle-aged and neurotypical, they're going to have excellent metacognitive skills. They're going to be able to self-evaluate. They're going to be able to self-monitor. So the ability for them to have feedback at a reduced level makes sense. But what about the preschooler with speech motor disorders or speech sound disorders? Do they have the metacognitive skills to self-evaluate their speech, to self-monitor their speech at the preschool level? The research indicates no, 
the research indicates that that doesn't develop until about age six, these type of metacognitive skills. So the problem you can see from afar <clears throat> is this kind of doesn't make sense because the adult that's neurotypical, that's working on their golf swing, requires much less feedback than a child with speech sound disorders or speech motor disorders, who we know because of the speech sound disorder is also going to likely have difficulties accurately perceiving the sound. That too will likely be compromised. So let's talk about the principal motors of learning. And we're gonna talk about three areas of feedback that's recommended for the golf swinging middle-aged man but does not apply, I would say the opposite is recommended for a preschool age child based on the research we have available. The first principle is called knowledge of performance. And knowledge of performance over knowledge of results. Knowledge of performance refers to specific feedback. Okay, so what are you doing correctly? I see angry dog teeth. Err, oh, so scary. I can see your angry dog teeth. The snake sound. Awesome. I see you're keeping the snake in the cage. That's called KP and the principles of motor learning or knowledge of performance. You're giving specific feedback on the child's motor behavior. There's also knowledge of results. Now, knowledge of results, is it correct or is it wrong? Now, for this golf swinging middle-aged man, that's neurotypical, the research indicates if you give them the yay correct or the nay wrong, they're gonna figure it out and self-evaluate. What are they doing correctly? What are they doing wrong? And, and they're gonna improve it, that that's effective for them. But when we move to the preschool age, we have so many studies and systematic reviews that show that specific feedback is way better, statistically significantly better for preschoolers with and without disabilities. We want to do the opposite of what the principles of motor learning recommend at the preschool level. That is what they're going to benefit from. The research indicates the right wrong feedback is much, much less beneficial for preschoolers. So you only have 45 minutes a week if you're working in the schools with preschoolers like myself. You have 45 minutes a week. Give them the top shelf feedback. Give them the specific KR, I mean KP, excuse me. Give them the specific K. P feedback, knowledge of performance, objective feedback on what they are doing. Don't give them the second rate feedback, which is, is it right or wrong? They do not have the metacognitive skills to figure out why it is right or why it is wrong at the preschool level, particularly a preschooler that has a speech sound disorder in which perception is likely also compromised. So that's principle one, which if you're working with the middle-aged golfer, that's neurotypical, knowledge of results is better. If you're working with the preschooler, the opposite is true, knowledge of performance. So do not apply the principles of motor learning in hoping that the child will better generalize from getting the second rate feedback. We have lots of studies that show that the more specific the feedback, the better at the preschool age. So what is the second principle of feedback with principles of motor learning? And the second principle is the immediacy of the feedback. So the second principle states that if you delay the feedback, you're going to get better results with the golfer, okay? However, the research is very clear that if you're working with a preschooler with or without disabilities, the more immediate feedback, the better the results. So do not put the principles of motor learning with that apply to the golfer. Don't do that with the preschooler and hold back on feedback so the child can metacognitively self-evaluate. You're missing a valuable teachable moment, immediate. 
This is another situation where the principles of motor learning do not apply to a preschooler with speech sound disorders. They have perception issues, very likely. Many of them also have other issues that involve taking in stimuli from the environment and processing it, processing language, processing difficulties. So we need to make it very salient that, yeah, that's it right there, right there, the second they do it. Once again, this is a situation, number two, where the principles of motor learning do not apply. Don't use it at the generalization level. You only have 45 minutes a week with these children. Give them the top shelf feedback, which is the frequent feedback. Don't hold back on these children. More is more. That's what the research shows with preschoolers. Let's go to the third feedback method when it comes to the principles of motor learning. The third feedback method has to do with the frequency of feedback. How often are you giving feedback? So with the golfer that's neurotypical, that adult, the research indicates that less feedback is beneficial. That gives the golfer time to self-monitor and self-evaluate. Now remember, now we're going over to a preschooler with speech sound disorders. And many children with communication impairments are much more likely to have attentional issues as well. So this idea of giving them less feedback doesn't make sense already. But we know from the research that more is more. The more frequent the feedback, the better. So when we look at the children with communication impairments, many of the children on my caseload, the parents are telling me he's having all these problems at school. He's biting, he's kicking, he's redirecting, he's been put in time out, the principal called me. These preschoolers are not succeeding 80% of the day. They are failing, many of them, 80% of the day. When they come to our speech therapy, they come with an empty bucket. It's our job to fill that bucket up. I want you to lay that objective encouragement feedback on them, like frosting, frost the cake, frost the cake, give them the good stuff. I'm not talking about praise here. I'm talking about objective encouragement. I'm talking about, I like the way you're keeping your hands to yourself and catching them being good. Fill that bucket because their bucket is empty. These are children that have spent most of their day being redirected. Can you imagine what that does to your self-esteem? So the worst thing you can do is they come into speech therapy and you only have 45 minutes a week and you're holding back on the feedback in hopes that they're going to generalize because they're going to use these metacognitive skills that typically develop in the middle of school age. No, this is not best practice. This will not promote generalization. This is just second rate for a preschooler. Pulling back on feedback is not beneficial. The research is very clear. The systematic research of many studies that preschoolers with and without disabilities, the more objective feedback you give them, the higher the frequency, the better the outcomes. So do not take what works for the middle-aged neurotypical golfer and apply it to a preschooler with speech sound disorders. I beg you. This article that was written is saying tutorial in 2008. It shouldn't say tutorial. It should say a theory. And it's a theory that's been researched and the research didn't pan out. The research that they do have is on two, four students. And 50% of the time it worked and 50% of the time it didn't work. That's called chance. And most of these students are not preschool age, they're elementary age. So they, they have better metacognitive skills. So even for them, there's no evidence base for it. In conclusion, we looked at today the three principles of feedback that purport to encourage generalization, but are really not at all developmentally appropriate for preschoolers and not at all evidence-based. Give them the good scuff, give them the specific objective feedback. We also looked at the immediacy of the feedback. Don't delay, give them the immediate feedback. Catch them being good. Give them the immediate feedback so that they know, okay, this is good. This one didn't hit the target. Many of the children with communication impairments, approximately half, also present with attentional impairments. So if you're waiting a minute 
that's about like an hour for a child with attentional impairments. It's like, that's the past. By the time you're telling me that I, I, I got that R right, they had good angry dog teeth. And the third one we looked at is the frequency. Give them as much objective encouragement as possible. These children have empty buckets that they come to us with. And I think one of the best things we, we can do is fill that bucket with the little time we have with them. Give them some resilience when they go back and leave your room in the world and, and they have all of these challenges that they must face. They've got a mountain that they have to climb. You got to pack that backpack for them. Fill it up. Fill up that water canteen. We looked at these three areas here. And like I said, do not follow the principles of motor learning. There's no research to support it. No expert even recommended it for treatment of childhood speech sound disorders. Edwin Moss himself, who wrote this article, wrote in 2012, is warranted in extrapolating from the non-speech motor learning literature for treatment of childhood apraxia of speech. But yet, so many people are doing it and so many are recommending it. And as a result, we got off the track and so many people got off the track and they're doing non-evidence-based practice that's actually going against the research base that we do have that has shown to do the contrary to what the principles of motor learning purport. So I encourage you, don't drink the Kool-Aid of principles of motor learning. I know it sounds smart. I, I follow the principles of motor learning when it comes to childhood apraxia of speech. It might sound good, but it's not. It's not good. So the question you might be asking, well, how do we generalize then, Kelly, if we're not going to lessen the feedback, if we're not going to pull back on the knowledge of performance, if we're not going to pull back on how immediate the feedback is, if we're not going to pull back on the frequency, don't pull back on any of that ever. The way we're going to get generalization, and I write about this in my book. So check out my book if you haven't checked it out yet. There's a whole chapter on this. Can you guess how are we going to get generalization through complexity? So it's kind of like if you go and you're training for a marathon and you're going out there and you're running 18 mile runs and your friend calls you up and you say, says, I do you want to do the turkey trot with me. It's a 5k run downtown Detroit. You're going to say, yeah, you know, of course I'll be there in an hour. And that's because you've trained for something much more complex. So you are capable of this level and you can generalize to any place, to any setting, even if you didn't sleep the night before, to anywhere, you're gonna do a great job. Now, it works similarly in speech sound disorders. What our research clearly found is you need to go over your goal for generalization to occur. So don't work on two element blends. If your goal is two element blends, because the child's not gonna produce the two element blends on the test. The child's not gonna produce the two element blends outside of your therapy room. Instead, work on three element blends. So what happens in the brain is you create these complex neuronal connections in which the two element blends will naturally develop. Because in therapy, you're working on three element blends. You're creating complex neuronal connections. The same thing is true with language. If your goal is for the child to speak in complex sentences, work on having the child tell a narrative with a beginning and a middle and an end in therapy. So you're creating these complex neuronal connections in which the child's telling a story. When the child leaves the therapy room, the child is able to spontaneously tell a complex sentence. Just like you're able to spontaneously run a 5K, even if you're like dehydrated and didn't sleep the night before. Because in training, you're doing a marathon. That's how I explain it to parents. With augmentative and alternative communication, if in your therapy, the child is identifying the core and then the, and then the category, and then the child's finding the fringe to request what they want. When they leave your room, they're doing this complex behavior. They'll just do the core at home, which is great. So we're creating complex neuronal connections in the brain.
Generalization is not an external process. You can't make it happen externally through your feedback. You can make it happen internally through complex action. Just like the marathon. If you're able to do a marathon, you can do the 10K, you can do the 5K, you can do the half. It's the same thing in therapy. You give them all of your cues and all of your tools that you have, everything in your toolbox that makes you special as a speech language pathologist, and you go very complex. And that's how generalization is going to occur. You can't go at it. You must go over it. So there's a chapter in the book about that. If you want to know more about how to do complex language, I'm so excited because in my Sparkle in School membership this month, I love this because I am going to share with my members. So if you're not a member yet, you're going to want to make sure to join this. My complex language treatment card that I just developed. And it is crazy good. So that's what I'm talking about. In therapy, the children are going to be telling stories. They're going to have this visual support. They're going to have the print support to do so. And when they leave your therapy room, the parents are going to hear spontaneously complex sentences all over the place. So if you haven't joined the Sparkle in School membership yet, just check it out. And if it's not your jam, you can cancel if you're taking the monthly membership at any time. But I do want you to check it out. It is that good. And I love learning with you. So my email is always available. And people email me and they tell me, well, these are issues I'm having. And I love it because challenge creates change for me and you as therapists as well. And when we have these issues, it makes our therapy better. So I love working closely with so many speech pathologists all over Canada and all over the United States. It's wonderful. I want you to join that group and I want you to grow with me. And I want you to innovate practice with me and I want you to change your lives with me. So I want you to take on this information that we covered today, roll up your sleeves and make the world a better place, one child at a time. And you are first.